Tonight, we take a look at the energy sector in Nigeria as the power grid has collapsed 98 times under the Buhari administration amid 1.52 trillion naira bailout and the fuel scarcity situation, even as New Bank threatens a nationwide strike. Again, the National Security Advisor Major General Baba Ghana Mungono forecast an estimated $23 billion loss this year if crude oil theft remains unchecked. This is Plus Politics. I am Mary Anakol. In 2022, Nigeria's energy sector, which should be generating about 80% of government's revenue, got severely battered. The sector was characterized by nationwide blackouts due to repeated collapse of the power grid, fuel scarcity, inability to commence the full implementation of the petroleum industry bill, leading to an extension of the removal of fuel subsidy and unmet targets uh, for project execution. This indeed left millions of Nigerians at the receiving end. The country is also battling with oil theft as it consistently failed to meet its oil projection of 1.8 million barrels per day due to massive oil theft. Now experts have said that Nigeria loses about 600,000 barrels of crude oil per day to thieves and the Nigerian National Petroleum Corporation NNPC has however admitted losses of 470,000 barrels per day. While this discrepancy exists, um, what is however certain is that much of our crude oil is stolen on a daily basis. Well, joining us to discuss this and more is Fine Face Dunamine. He is the Executive Director, Youth and Environmental Advocacy Centre. Also joining us is uh, Comrade Celestin Akbobri, he's the National Coordinator of Ogoni Solidarity Forum, and Olaleko Ige, he is a journalist. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for joining us. Good evening. Good evening and thank you for having us on the program. Good evening. Thank you, viewer. All right. Um, I'm going to start with um, you, um, Fine Face. It's very interesting that I think you and I have had this conversation um, late 2022 um, about, you know, the energy sector and the issue of oil theft. Let's start from there. Um, a lot of people would point to other countries who have been blessed, just like Nigeria, with um, the kind of natural resources that we have, especially crude. Uh, but in the case of Nigeria, can we really say that it's a blessing? Yes, we can say the oil we have in Nigeria is a blessing because uh, we didn't buy it. God deposited it under our soil. And uh, it has been helping to contribute to the development of the country. The same way it is contributing to environmental pollution and destruction of sources of livelihoods of fishermen and farmers in the Niger Delta. And the same way that those who are involved in the massive crude oil theft that is going on in the Niger Delta, from those who steal the crude oil for illegal bunkering activities and those who steal the crude oil for illegal artisanal crude oil refining. The oil has been contributing to national development because today, if you look at Nigeria as a country, I think Nigeria the major foreign exchange earner for the country is crude oil that the country exports outside the country oil was uh, uh, agriculture was booming before you have the, uh, the, the oil came into operation but to a very large extent i believe that uh, despite the challenges we are having in the oil and gas sector is still something that i can say is a blessing except when you look at the other bad aspect of it the environmental pollution that we have had how it is destroying the sources of livelihood and of fishermen and farmers. And then those who are getting involved in this and you know bon illegally bunkering this product out of the country. But to a very large extent, I think uh, it is a blessing. But we cannot continue to depend on this blessing because today the world is moving away from hydrocarbon to you know clean and renewable energy. And it should be the direction that we should follow as we move forward as a nation. I like, I like where you ended, but I'll come back to that. Let me go to Mr. Kwabari. Mr. Kwabari, you obviously are from one of those communities that this oil is supposedly a blessing has somewhat become a curse of sorts because, of course, your farmers 
are unable to go to their farms. The fish in the river is dying because of pollution. And of course, the issue of high prep and the agonic cleanup comes to play. Um, but I want to go back to the basics. Um, just like Fine Face said, there was a time where there was an agriculture boom and Nigeria's dependence was on agriculture and other natural resources. At what point did we realize that you know, oil can become a mainstay? And, and why did we abandon other aspects of the economy to depend on oil, even as we have depended on oil? How has that helped you know, the growth and development of this country? Mr. Kwabri, can you hear me? Uh, I don't think that okay. we can hear I'm him. Sorry. Okay. I'm sorry, I was muted. Okay, go ahead. Um, I, I, I disagree completely with my brother Francis to say that um, oil has been sort of blessing. Maybe it's been a blessing to those that are in Abuja that, that does not live here, the Niger Delta, that have not seen or suffer any of the negative consequences of oil extraction. But as far as I'm concerned, the, the day um, we abandon our ag agricultural produce to focus on oil, that was the beginning of our doom. Because um, as an Ogoni, I know that as a young, young, young man, when you come back from school, you go to the river, get some, some catch, make your food, eat, and then you go back to the really go for the real fishing that you will sell to make money. These fishes, you don't feed them. You only go come, get them, sell on a daily basis. I'm not saying that farming is bad, but those that are upland or goni, they go to farm, they cultivate the farm. In nine or ten months' time, they will go to harvest. The harvest was very rich. I used to follow my mother to the farm, the two heads of cassava, we are gone. Today, you will, you will approve one local government, you won't get a basin. And, and that's because the oil, oil extraction has sucked the land, poisoned the environment, the air that we breathe. Life has become so short here. And of course, I don't need to tell you that if Ogoni did not have oil, Ken Sarawewa, and 2,000 others would have been alive. But in 1995, the government of Nigeria and Shell chose oil over blood of very important of this country. So you don't expect an Ogoni man. Even with the UNEP report, which are called a death sentence on Ogoni environment and Ogoni that are alive, you don't expect any person still staying alive in Ogoni to call oil a blessing. And it will never be a blessing. Why do you think that uh, politicians decided to take oil as the mainstay? Um, because like I said in my opening, Nigeria is blessed. We have all kinds of mineral sources. We have gas, natural gas, all sorts of things that we could um, you know, be making money on if we faced them uh, as squarely as, we sh as we're facing you know, our oil and gas sector. Um, is it that it's easier? Was it that it was easy money and, and that's why you know, it became a mainstay and every other sector seemed to have died or dwindled right after you know, we discovered it? No, it's just, it's just because our people are lazy. They don't think, you know, they don't think. Don't see me. Are you telling me that, that Nigeria has oil more than America? No, we don't have oil more than America. But they, they, even if they have oil, they kept it as a result and focus on other sectors of the economy. So our people are lazy and, and love it the easy way. So while they are sleeping, their account is reading and they wake up and see price of money. And that's why they could easily abandon the granite pyramid, the cocoa, the oil palm. Look at Norway, the Kenya. Malaysia came here to, to, to pick um, palm, palm nuts. Today, look at what oil palm, palm oil has, has, has done to the economy of Malaysia. I mean, just, just, just look at it, that people came here to pick our palm nuts and look at what, what the economy has done. So it means that if we are concentrated on the granite pyramid, on the cocoa, on the palm oil, 
on other things that we have. We would have done better today because um, you will not steal and loot the money from farming the way you spent and loot the money from oil that you don't do anything about. You just sleep and wake up and see it in your account. And because um, people don't work to get it, they, they, they spent it as if it is falling from heaven. Hmm. Let me come to you, um, Olalekon. You obviously are a journalist and you've been in the Niger Delta for quite a while. So you obviously uh, can talk more about, um, let's talk about the politics um, in the oil and gas sector and how um, it has one way or the other cost or solved, if there be any, uh, some of the problems that we are facing in the Niger Delta and in the country in general. Um, he talked about the fact that our people are lazy and uh, hence, you know, the oil... Um, becoming our mainstay, but then we've established that fact. Why do you think that the Nigeria oil and gas sector is the way it is? Remember recently, the NNPC just got a window dressing and a rechristening ceremony, uh, but then Zero Naira has been um, gotten into the, has been remitted into the Nigerian coffers or the federal government's coffers from the rechristened NNPC. Where did we go wrong? Well, I think it's uh, because of our inability to think as a nation uh, it is oil a blessing maybe to some extent but largely it's not been the real blessing uh, we'll have expected in nigeria remember that the uh, oil is not even the number one contributor to nigeria's gdp the number one contributor to nigeria's gdp as of today is agriculture meaning that even the oil and gas that god has blessed us with we are not even making full use of it as of today none of the refineries in nigeria are working. We're only expecting that the Botaco refinery will come on stream in 2023. Dangote refinery, we expect that to come on stream in 2023. Meaning, even as it is, even with the derivatives that can be gotten from the oil and gas, is Nigeria even able to harness it to ensure that it contributes to our GDP? As of today, we're importing aviation fuel, we're, involved, we're importing diesel, we're importing kerosene, we're importing petrol. I'm sure you know that there are several derivatives through uh, fractional distillation in the oil and gas sector. They are talking of bitumen, they are talking of diesel, mm -hmm. they are talking of low pore oil, they are talking of uh, kerosene, which is DPK, they are talking of petrol, they are talking of diesel, a whole lot of things that have come out of the fractional distillation, uh, especially when it comes to petroleum products. And you can be rest assured, and of course, a lot of Nigerians know that 90% of these things are imported. So even with the oil and the gas that we have, it's not even contributing to Nigeria's GDP, meaning we are rather exporting and <laughs> we are rather exporting what is our blessing and importing what we should rather have been able to develop uh, locally. So you find out that the oil and gas sector, like uh, Celeste Napobari said, you know, is the easiest approach. You are sleeping and your account is being credited. Once you're able to extract the oil from the ground, you're able to separate it and you're able to export, the production continues. You only have to monitor and ensure the pipelines are working, the flow stations are working, the export terminal is working. Once all of these are done, then you can be less assured that uh, you can be making easy money, unlike agriculture and some other uh, sectors of the economy that requires much more of industry, much more of uh, competition, much more of contribution in terms of expertise, in terms of human resource and all of that, they begin to understand why Nigeria has struggled in spite of the abundance of oil and gas that we have in this country. People make, I mean, the, the whole world watched what happened in Qatar in 2022, the first time a Middle Eastern country was hosting the World Cup. And all of this was made um, possible by the oil that they have in that country and we can see um you know what what is being done with and that's detail for uh, the uae and that's detail for saudi arabia why can't the same be said about nigeria which a lot of people would say is the big brother here in africa what do you think the challenge is being that many people have campaigned about you know on this oil and the corruption in the sector and trying to bring you know nigeria to its pride of place even though several other aspects of the economy are being left to suffer well i think there's nothing qatar did that nigeria cannot do qatar is not richer than nigeria by every stretch of imagination nigeria is better than qatar in terms of human resource nigeria is better blessed than qatar in terms of numerous 
you know, natural and human resource that anybody can think of in this world. It, there's nothing spectacular that Qatar did that Nigeria cannot do. Only that we have not been able to put our acts together. I'm sure you might be aware of figures, you know, that are being rolled out to say, look, this is the amount of money that have, that have been uh, stolen, you know, from oil theft. This is how much it means in, in terms of oil theft. So you can imagine, if we're able to put all of our resources together, if we can reason, if we can come together, if we can get governance better, if we can get the citizenry of Nigeria better, because a lot of people advocate for better government. There's no way you can have a better country without better citizens. Better citizens will translate to better leadership. So you cannot be expecting the, uh, the leadership, you know, to be sent overnight. Why the rest of Nigerians as nationals will continue to do things the way they are doing things at the moment. So you expect a better country without better citizens, which is why Qatar and much of the countries that have oil have been able to develop beyond human comprehension. Look look at the United Arab Emirates. It's not as if United Arab Emirates is richer than Nigeria on all fours, but they have been able to put their acts together. They've been able to unnerve the resource, maximize everything that they can get out of the crude oil God has blessed them with. And you can see the transformation as of today. United Arab Emirates is raising huge amount of money from tourism, meaning they're already trying to diversify away from the crude oil, you know, that they have in large quantities. So tourism is becoming the major gross domestic product in, in the United um, Arab Emirates. Qatar has just done that. And there's nothing that Nigeria cannot do if we put our ass together and resolve okay. to put this nation first. But unfortunately, that is not what we are doing at the moment. Let me come back to you, Fine Face. Um, let's talk about... I mean, because you said that it's not just the job of the leaders, it's also a community, so it has to be all hands on deck, we concerted efforts. Uh, but let's bring it back to the Niger Delta, where most of the oil is. Um, before we had the, the upsurge of the insurgency, there had been claims and counterclaims of governments and international oil companies conniving with certain community leaders and government officials to um, somewhat fleece the people of something that is due them. Let's talk about that corruption and, and, and how it has, you know, eaten deep into, um, you know, these oil communities and, of course, the fabrics of leadership in the country. Yeah, thank you very much once again. I, I think that when you talk about oil in Nigeria, you don't just begin by situating it in the Niger Delta. You have to begin and start talking about oil from the federal level, then you cascade to the periphery and states and sub-region where it is actually being exploited, which is the Niger Delta. And that was why I tried to trace what has happened in the oil and gas sector from the national level and it being a blessing. And then it's a big cause to the people that the oil is found under their soil. If you look at the Niger Delta and the way it has been operated in the oil and gas sector and those in the industry, you will discover that the multinational oil companies that operate here actually, like you mentioned, connive with some of the local uh, bourgeois to surcharge the people of the Niger Delta. And when we talk about crude oil thefts, you cannot divorce the fact that those who are in the oil and gas sector are aiding and abating this process. Oil theft is not something that the local people can actually be able to do without the connivance of the multinational oil companies that are operating here and even the security operatives who are posted to provide security and prevent crude oil theft within the region. Because this oil we are talking about, the youths who are said to be involved in the artisanal refining after they steal the crude oil, they can't really exploit this oil from the soil. They have to tap into the pipelines that the multinational oil companies have been able to use to drill the oil from the, the, the soil. So in that case, you have a kind of connivance. You heard about the issue in the Niger Delta, especially in a Delta state where a, a pipeline that has been operated for about nine years was found, you know, without... Uh, you know, the people that are involved actually talking about it. So these are some of the things that happen here. And when you see this kind of thing going on, then you can talk about a network of syndicates of people who have decided to come together to go into this group that you see here. So I think Nigeria being a rentier state, whereby we depend on the renters, money that is paid by these foreign and multinational oil companies into their forces, they depend on this crude oil as the way they go. That is why it's even difficult to fight those who are involved in this, especially those who are also involved in this crude oil thefts from the multinational oil company perspective. How do the boys get to know when pressure is moving, when crude is passing through the pipeline? How do they get to have the technology of tapping into the pipeline? A lot of these people give them information on what they do. So they are aiding and abating this process, and that is why 
the end products of this action boils down to the local people in the Niger Delta, whereby you have their environment destroyed, you have the water body destroyed in such a way that fishermen are unable to fish. When they cast their net, what they cast is oil instead of fish. And when the, the farmers go to the farm, they are unable to really be able to have good produce from the environment as a result of the impact of this. And all these are at the expense of the ordinary people. Why those who are involved in this are smiling to the bank with the money they have made from this process. So for those who are making money from, through this process, especially the federal government of Nigeria that has 51% of stake in the oil and gas sector, oil is a perfect blessing to them. But for those who are in this and suffering as a result of this in the Niger Delta, including the Ogoni area, you see that oil is a big cost to them. How do we be able to balance it? We are talking about energy transition today. We cannot transit to clean and renewable energy or even go into agriculture that oil replaced in the 60s and, and, and 50 when it was found without use, raising money from the sale of crude oil that we have today. Because today we are not refining within the country. This 2023 is when we are expecting the modular, uh, talking about, uh, you know, the, 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 the Portaco refinery to come on board. We are talking about uh, Dangote to come on board. But then those two refineries cannot be able to give the country what we actually need in terms of the resources that will be needed to transit the economy. So we need to be able to look inwards and see how we can cascade money that will be coming from these sources to develop the economy. Because agriculture, which is the mainstay of the economy before there was a discovery of oil, contributed to our GDP until today. You see the greatest GDP contributor. So we need to go back and develop that. And the source that this money will come from is the sale of crude oil that we are having in the country. So we need to see how we'll be able to raise money from this source and be able to develop other sources like agriculture, manufacturing uh, uh, sector, and of course, try as much as possible to invest more in the energy sector, especially the solar and the clean and renewable energy that the country is moving to today. If we are able to put all this together, I believe that we can be able to lift oil in the soil. Other countries today are moving away from fossil fuel. But Nigeria cannot move away from fossil fuel for the next 20, 30 years mm. because the blueprint has not been put in place in such a way that we can move away from fossil fuel and we are able to succeed as a country. So as a country, we need to put all these, past, these things into perspective and work towards the possibility of being able to address the issues and corruption that we have in the energy sector so that we can be able to move away with the other parts of the world to the direction that the Fine world is face, going It now. sounds more to me like you're making a presentation to people who have no idea um, how to run this sector at, at, for a sector that's been running for so long and for governments who have asked us to give them a chance to run this country. Obviously, I, I don't believe that Nigeria doesn't have people who have the wherewithal or the know-how uh, as to put those things that you have recommended in place. So my question again is, if we have experts within and without this country, we have governments who have asked us to give them an opportunity to run us and run this sector, not doing these things, not because they do not know what it takes to do it, but because they've not done it. Why do you think that these, these things that you're saying, the ifs and if, 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 is going to come into fruition anytime soon, even in that 30 That's years? It. The greatest problem we have in this country is the problem of leadership. If we can get our leadership right, then we'll be able to fix our problem. That is why, as we are facing the 2023 what about the election I mean, next month... I'm not in any way holding brief for corrupt leadership or bad leadership or bad governance, but I'm saying we always are saying we need good leadership, good leadership, but these people come from amongst us. What about the followers? Are we sitting on our hands? The followers have a role to play. Like now, next month of February 25th, we are trying to recruit our leader. It is in the hands of the followers to recruit this leader through the ballot box. So if those who are going to vote will see the possibility of being able to recruit the person or the, the, the leaders that will be able to drive this process, then we can get this process right. Because it's a situation whereby we are trying to even move away from post safe way. And Nigeria as a country has not even been able to actualize itself in terms of really being able to maximize the fossil fuel that is found under its soil, then it becomes a problem. Nigeria has not been able to refine product that can be used locally. Today, when we talk about oil theft in the Niger Delta and some of these issues that are going on, like corruption in this sector, there are ways that we can fight and win this war. But then the followers and the leaders, they have a role to play. But more power is there in the hands of the leaders who need to summon the political will to be able to drive this problem. For example, we are talking about addressing crude oil theft in the Niger Delta. We are talking about how to bring about the modular refinery that should be able to address this issue to minimize crude oil theft and environmental pollution, including soot that we suffer. Government is not giving it attention. What does it take for them to drive that process? We have also proposed this presidential artisanal crude oil refining development initiative, which is a way of legalizing 
artisanal refining after modifying it to be more environmental friendly. Government is also taking steps, but nothing has been done so far to address it. We need to be able to address these issues in, in, uh, in a way that when the citizens suggest ways of addressing it, we have experts in the oil and gas industry. We put our heads together to see how we can address our problem. It is only when we can do this that we can look at a holistic and collective solution to the problem. But when we fail to address this problem because our leaders are also not being able to drive the process of addressing the problem, then I think we'll be having the issue that we are having at Anna Bay, not subside. So we need to be able to see how we can work together, synergize, to address the problem that we have in the oil and gas sector. Corruption is one of the things that is driving this process. And we need to see how we can collectively fight all these issues that we have so that we can address the issues in the oil and gas sector, right. move the country from fossil fuel to clean and renewable energy and agriculture for us to have a better nation and better environment. It's still plus politics and we're looking at the energy sector and what the government is doing. We still are being joined by Fine Face Dumnamene. He's the Executive Director, Youth and Environmental Advocacy Centre. We're also being joined by Comrade Akbobari Celestin. He's the National Coordinator of Goni Solidarity Forum. And we're being joined by Olaleko Ige. He is a journalist. Now, before we went on that break, we were talking about concerted efforts to change the situation of things in the oil and gas sector. But let me come back to you, uh, Mr. Kwabari. Let's talk about, um, you know, the issue of artisanal refining. I want to go all the way back to um, when we started having the situation of the suit in River State, um, um, where we had a, a, a particular matter uh, in the air. I'm sure it's still there and mostly was traced to the um, artisanal refining, where, which we call po fire, uh, you know, in River State. Uh, I remember Vice President Yemi Oshibadjo at some point saying that these, these um, artisanal refineries uh, would be one way or the other, you know, converted to, you know, um, modular refineries, if I'm getting it right. Uh, but nothing has been done in that regard. And the people in River State still are breathing in that particular matter. There is a government in the state, of course, who um, is supposedly to be pushing this at the federal level, but I don't think that that's uh, on the front burner for Governor Wiki. Um, again, for the people who are the ones who are at the receiving end, what are you doing, especially for you who's an environmental advo uh, advocate, what's being done in that regard? Well, um, without um, playing the devil advocate or defending uh, artisanal refiners, I think we are always blaming the victim here. Yeah. We are always blaming the victim. Um, before we started seeing what you call artisanal refining, we've always had gas flares that have been polluting our environment and everything that we have. We, we, we've also had several uh, fire outbreaks from oil fields that, have been, that, that we run for like one or two months. You saw the Koluama issue and several others that we've been running for like two months and nobody will come to copy until the whole river is soaked with crude. So, um, what the people are refining, what you call artisanal refining, what they are tampering with, is not up to 0.5%. 99.5% of what is polluting our environment comes from gas flaring, which, of course, the courts are stopped. But the oil companies and the government uh, officials have refused you know, to obey the law. Because since they control the government, they could choose who to be murdered and who to, who to stay alive. They can choose to kick and throw and, and all the, I mean. So I don't want us to dwell much about that. I'm talking about Osim Banjo and Modular Refinery. We, we, we have government that love to talk. Every year, they debate and pass budgets as a ritual for education, for health care for every other thing. Have you seen healthcare in Nigeria? Mr. President goes to London for EDEC, to treat EDEC. They pass budget for education, billions. Have you seen any university campus anywhere being better? They pass billions for electricity. Is there any community that has electricity or apart from water? So we have government that talks and they don't do. And, and, and I had one friend face was talking about um, crude oil theft and whatsoever, we should not sugarcoat these issues. You have a gang of thieves in government 
and a gang of thieves in the oil industry that go to bed together in the night. So when you have the two set of thieves together, you have a very worst case scenario such as we have in Nigeria today. The vessels they are using to steal crude oil is not a small taxi. Or oh, KK na Pebra, you can hide in somebody's compound. No. It's a huge vessel that before it enters into our waterway, the authority knows that so-so vessel is coming. And where it is best, and it will be there for like two, three months to load it full to the brim. You, that is day, cancer, who are called them daylight robbers. That is daylight robbery. They know. They think that those things will be happening for nine years. And nobody will know. They know. But you're always blaming, we're always blaming the victim. The community people are the victim. And we're always blaming them. The day the government officials and operators of the oil industry want crude oil theft to stop, it will stop. They are the people stealing the 99%. They only allow 1% to justify all the atrocities they are committing. But, but, but Mr. Mr. Pobre, I'm so sorry this to talk over you. I, I'm, I'm so sorry to talk over you. I just want to come in there. I, as much as you know, you keep saying that we're blaming the victim, how long are we going to keep playing the victim? And from what you're saying, it makes it seem like the, uh, the hands of the average Nigerian is tied. And so we have to just keep waiting until government decides if they're going to get their acts right. And how long can that be? How long can we go on like that? And how many more people are we going to lose yeah. lands and property yeah. the people in that need regard? To take the people... The people need to take their destiny in their hands. The Ogoni people got up. Yeah, we paid dearly for it, but we got up and we stopped them. We stopped oil production in Ogoni since 1993. Until today, nobody, you know, has dared to do it. I know they are passing through the back doors. Even after this morning, today is the 30th anniversary of Ogoni Day, commemoration of Ogoni Day. We I saw a jingle sponsored by NMPC. NMPC does not love us. They partner with Share to kill Ogoni people. The partner we share to pollute our environment and destroy our livelihood, so they cannot claim to be loving us this morning. But they are only doing that because they want to pass through the back door to come and take our oil, and we will not allow it. Because oil has remained a cost to the, to the organic people. If it is not a cost to others, it is a cost to us, and we will not allow any production of oil in our soil anymore. Hmm. So the community people need to take their destiny in their hands. In fact, our fishing business has been completely eroded and destroyed. Our farming business is gone. Now that the people are predominantly fishermen and farmers, we can no longer farm, we can no longer fish. Mm. Because the gas that are flared in very close proximity to human habitation create 24 hour daylight in the river where the fishes do not stay. So fishes now migrate to the deeper ocean, uh, Atlantic, where we don't have. A fishing trawler. So poverty, hunger are setting. The people need to take back these territories, chase away these thieves. They are thieves hmm. who have come to, 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 to poke our wounds and put pepper in it. <laughs> okay. Our wounds are bleeding and they are poking pepper in it. These guys should live. There is nothing we are benefiting from, from oil. Okay. All right. Uh, back to you, Olaleko. Let me come to you. Um, during the campaign, so when the, the beginning of the campaign, I think it was the Nigerian Bar Association that invited presidential candidates from different political parties um, when they were having their annual general meeting to speak on their plans for Nigeria. And I do remember vividly the Social Democratic Party presidential candidate, Prince uh, Adebayo, um, raised the issue of oil theft and how many barrels the, is being stolen every single day. And it became a, a very big topic and it's still being discussed as we speak today. And then fast forward, um, all of a sudden, the NNPC seems to be walking night and day and then found an oil vessel or pipelines that were leading to an oil vessel. Uh, all of a sudden, it appeared from nowhere. And while Nigerians were still trying to contemplate, the army decided to destroy that oil vessel. And, and I remember the chief of um, you know, the army saying that um, there was nothing to investigate. What does that really say about you know, how serious we are in terms of fighting corruption, especially in this sector, which we, again, I'd like to reiterate, have not been able to make any monies from in the last year? Olaleko, can you hear me? 
Uh, I don't think we have Olaleko. Olaleko, can you hear me, please? Uh, I think we've lost him. So I'm, I'm going to toss that question to you, fine face. Let's see if you can do justice. Well, you may need to recast the question again. So, I was focusing on you giving it to me. Yes, so I was talking about the fact that the yeah. SDP presidential candidate had raised the alarm about the, uh, the oil thefts that's happening and how much of our crude is disappearing um, from the country. And he pointed fingers at the federal government and the NNPC as people who knew about this theft and were covering it up. And then, of course, I'm talking about the fact that the army had destroyed that oil vessel without any investigation, and the army chief had said there was no need for an investigation. So how do we deal with that corruption if the people who are law enforcement, they themselves have their hands stained? Yes, I think the SDP presidential candidate is 100% correct to say that the federal government and, of course, NMPC know about the crude oil theft going on. They have information about that. Look, the presidency, let me say the president, is the chief security officer of this country, is the all-knowing human being as far as Nigeria is concerned because he gets briefs from the nooks and crannies of this country every day. He gets him a briefing from the security officer at every corner. The NNPC, they are the umpire in charge of our crude oil in this country. They have information about those who are involved in this. They can't deny the fact that they don't have information. They can also deny the fact that maybe in a one way or the other, they are not allegedly part and parcel of what is going on. Illegal bunkering and crude oil theft using vessels is not the business of poor people. It's not the business of poor you. It is big men business. Now, it is only those that are in government, those in the security sectors, that can actually be able to steal crude oil. So to a very large extent, people that are key in our security architecture, our security system, they are aware of this. Look, do you know what it means for a barge, a vessel, to travel into Nigeria, into Nigeria territorial waters, load crude oil in weeks and months, and go back undetected? It's not possible. That can only happen where there are no human beings. I understand that we have ungovernable uh, ungovern spaces and ungoverned spaces in this country. And I understand that, uh, uh, you know, immigration have said that we have about 1,409 illegal routes into this country. But I know quite well that vessel of that nature that is said to be the size of a football pitch or even two times that cannot come into a country, load crude oil and go back without the people that are overseeing the affairs of the country being aware of that. So it is a cartel, it's a network. It is a, 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 a in fact, it's just like we are still having. Uh, I don't think that we can hear you anymore, fine face. We lost your audio, if you can hear us. Fine yeah, face. I can hear you. I All right, go ahead, I can go hear ahead. You. We lost your yeah, audio. So I can say that what is going on in the Gulf of Guinea is very, very serious. And I think that the security operatives are allegedly aware of it because they cannot have a system whereby you can have vessels come into Nigeria, look for oil and go back with it being detected. And as a way of mitigating this, which is happening, we at Advocacy Center, we have developed what we call Network Against Organized Crime in Nigeria and the Gulf of Guinea. And we have proposed it to the federal government at the National Council on Hydrocarbon in Minanaja State that happens that we should be able to work on these processes and be able to put together a network that will enable us to share information in such a way that those who come into the country to load our crude oil and go away with it can no longer be able to do so. Mm. So if you don't have a government take action on some of these things, then they cannot deny the fact that they are aiding and abating these processes. And I think the bulk of work is on the table of security operatives that have been charged with the responsibility of policing and providing security for our pipelines and in the oil and gas sector. Mr. Bobbery, um Recently, uh, the federal government, just before the close of 2022, the federal government had earmarked almost a trillion, if not more, um, to, you know, work on the refineries in, in the country. And of course, they're still paying salaries to people working in the refineries that refineries are not refining anything. Because again, as we all know, these products are sent outside of the country. We paid foreign currency to refine it. And then we still bring it back into the country, paying monies for it to come in. Now, we all, before we go into, you know, the fact that we're having problems with, you know, fuel, let's talk about why government is still fixing refineries that are not working. And then every time we talk about refining, we point to Dangote's refinery, which we do not know when it's going to be ready, but that's not necessarily a government refinery. So why do we have refineries that are not working? Well, um... 
I, I, I told you before that, that you are dealing with a gang of thieves, and that is, you, you should call them by their name. Ken are who are called them daylight robbers, and that is who they are. It is very easy to wake up a man who is sleeping. I've always said that. But to wake up a man who is pretending to sleep is difficult. You will poke him and poke him, he will not wake up because he's pretending to sleep. How do you even, even think about that government will wake up year after year, budget billions of dollars to serve this refinery and it is not working? They are telling you lies. You know, you look at the, the set of people that are in, in, within the NFPC and the presidency. They are from one, one, one section of the country that does not even feel the pain that we are feeling here. All of them have refineries in neighboring countries. They are the people bringing in these vessels to steal crude oil to these refineries, refine the crude, and sell it at cultural prices to Nigeria. They, 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 they own the refineries around. So they will never allow refineries in Nigeria to work. They will not allow the people to have electricity because they are the people importing generators into this country. And the people have just become their market. Hmm. They want to see every person dead. And, they are, and, and, and it is so sad that, you know, they continue to amass wealth, gather this money, money that they will not even spend. They continue to steal and stockpile money. Some are buried in places they don't even know again. So you are dealing with daylight robbers okay. who know exactly what they are doing. Mm. They are not, they, they are thieves. They know what they are doing. Okay. Not that they don't know that the refinery will not be working. No, they don't allow those people, their pay salaries, so that, you know, uh, peanuts, like, like I give you my share. You have mm. my share now, and all the bottles. You give me one bottle. What they are giving to those workers is not one bottle. And they take the whole share and the rest and the remaining bottle. They know what they are doing. Wow. Let, um, fine face, let me come back to you until we're able to get a laleco back let's talk about the issue of um you know fuel scarcity um just before the close of november into december i'm sure that several people especially in lagos um had queues unending queues to buy fuel and of course the price has gone up to the roof transportation has you know the price of transportation has more than doubled and i mean including market prices everything has literally hit the roof and that's because of one thing, inability to get fuel. And let's not forget, before we go talk about the, you know, the grid that has collapsed so many times, we've been unable to power our houses. So again, there's a serious reliance on fuel. Now, recently, the Burundian government uh, visited Mr. President, if not yesterday, um, and they talked about the fact that they would need Nigeria to support them in getting fuel. Uh, so that they can deal with the fuel situation. And our president, Mr. Uh, General Muhammad Buhari, um, well, he did say to the Burundian government that um, the NNPC will see to the issue of their fuel and, and Nigeria will be supporting them with fuel. But it, it beats me because we're yet to be able to deal with the issue of fuel scarcity and we're in 2023 in January uh, and our president is assuring Burundi that they will have fuel. Where's it going to come from? I think uh, it is unfortunate and a bad mission that the Burundian delegation led to Nigeria. I think they didn't do their analysis thoroughly. Their experts and strategy didn't advise them thoroughly before they come to Nigeria to seek for fuel. How can you come to a country who has not been able to produce fuel to make its domestic market have sufficient product to come and give you fuel in your country? How can you come to a country where none of the refineries are working to seek for fuel in your country? How can you come to a country that imports fuel from other countries and the, uh, the importation is not, uh, the imported fuel is not even enough locally to come and give you fuel in your country? How can you come to a country that has refused to license modular refineries to contribute to the uh, production of crude oil to give you fuel in your country? How can you come to a, a, a country where every product, every crude oil that drops is being taken out to refine and then they buy in to come and give you fuel for your country. How can you come to a country that refine, uh, that buy, import this crude and the, the petroleum product into the country and pay subsidy to come and give you fuel for your country? It, it's not possible. You can't give what you do not have. So the, con the president was very tactical because he believes that the uh, Burundian delegation didn't really think well before coming to meet Nigeria, seeking for help for petroleum product, because Nigeria does not have 
So what he simply said was that NNPC will see to it. How can NNPC see it? NNPC does not even have solution to the problem they are seeking in Nigeria. So they can't give what they do not have. Nigeria does not have what is even sufficient for it. How much more being able to give it out? If they are talking about they need crude oil from Nigeria, and Nigeria can look into that and give them crude oil. But if they are talking about this product, it cannot work. Nigerians have been suffering for the past two months now. We have been suffering to just get fuel into our cars. A, a, a liter of petrol now at the finish line is over 400 naira in some areas, a little less in some areas, and long queues at the filling station. Many Nigerians are unable to travel to their community because of the high cost of uh, 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 fuel. And you are coming at that particular point in time, seeking help from a country to give you fuel. Where will they get it from? Nigeria do not have, and Nigeria cannot give what they do not have. The presidency referring them to NNPC, NNPC cannot also be able to respond to it. How are they going to be able to respond to it? So I think it is a bad mission that they came on, and Nigeria will not be able to do it. Even when the two the refineries come on stream, Portaco refinery, Wari refinery, and of course the Katuna refinery, and even the Dangote refinery, they will not be able to even export a drop of oil outside the country. The only crude oil, they, I mean, uh, petrol they can take outside Nigeria is maybe those that uh, are stolen or those that are smuggling this product outside the country. That is the one they can take out because the, all these refineries put together cannot even be able to refine what Nigeria needs locally. How much more having some to export? I understand we are even exporting electricity that we don't have sufficient in the country. These are some of the anomalies you see within the system. But I think that what we need to do as a people is to be able to satisfy Nigerians, provide enough for the country to be able to run. Nigeria needs energy to be able to run. The poverty in Nigeria today can be reduced if we have steady electricity and we have cheaper uh, you know, a petroleum product because we have enough crew that can give us this. So in as much as we are unable to meet some of these conditionalities, then it is difficult for Nigeria to even be able to grow properly because energy is key to drive some of these processes. And it, as a contribution to this, we are also trying to see how we can push to put, talk about solar in communities. Nigeria should try as much as they can to be able to address its internal contradictions in the oil and gas sector before they can talk about trying to offer help to other countries of the world. Um, to you, Mr. Kwabari, Nigeria's available power generation capacity actually fell uh, by 981.8 megawatts between 2015 and I think August of 2022, despite the fact that um, over 1.51 trillion naira uh, intervention uh, in the sector was done by the federal government since the current administration came on board. Um, the national grid, I must say, and I'm sure that you are aware, um, has collapsed 98 times under President Muhammad Buhari's uh, government. And um, power generation has been on the lowest of lows. Um, for a country, again, that is willing to, to, to service other nations uh, as opposed to giving its people the best, um, <laughs> is there an end in sight? Because I wonder. If we are unable to generate power for our country, um, and then of course we're talking about poverty, we're talking about businesses that are um, being destroyed, uh, we're looking for foreign investments, but uh, under what circumstances can those investments and businesses run if we cannot even power our country? And of course, 2023 is around the corner, politicians are here asking us to vote for them. Um, what questions should we be asking them? Well, um, do we even have any question to, to, to ask them? You don't have any question to ask them because from time to time, the story has been the same. So what we need to do is to punish those that we can punish with our PVC. For instance, um, another opportunity presents itself uh, one or two months from now. I think Nigeria needs to come out. There are people that should not even be talking about contesting election anymore, judging from what we have seen, you know, from the Buari administration. You have an absentee president that every month is out of the country. And you, you have those who, they are not even there yet. And every now and then, they are outside the country. Apart from, I think, uh, Peter Obida is around. I think to basically based in Dubai. Tinubu is always out of the country for one treatment or the other. So Nigeria need to, you know, seize this opportunity. I've told you before, when you talk about electricity, we don't have enough. Not that we cannot do it, but the political will is not there because those that 
are importing generators into the country are those in charge of the power ministry. Those that own refineries around the sub-region are those that should be fixing our refineries. And I don't like, like, like Francis said, internal contradiction. You have a country that export what they have oil, but it is oil that we import. The transportation system that is a problem in this country, we have built a railway to Niger Republic. We don't have electricity, but we are supplying electricity to neighboring countries. You see Nigeria send people out to go and monitor some countries to ensure that they have free and fair elections. While we have inconclusive elections here every time and rigged elections. You have Nigeria that will rush to any country that there is a coup to say, hey, you must govern your people well. When we have the worst form of, of governance here in this country. So these are the contradictions that voters need to, you know, take advantage of this coming election to you know, stand their feet to say, if we perish, we perish. We don't want this, we don't want that anymore. Because, I mean, these people will not be born again. <laughs> there are people that have been within the corridor of power all these years. Okay. They are not new. So one new thing, will they bring? Okay. Great question. Now, finally, um, fine face. Um, the government has said that retaining petrol subsidy, which is my final question, uh, in 2023 will cost Nigeria nearly 6.7 trillion naira. Now, let me remind you, um, Occupy Nigeria was a thing, and most of the people who led that particular um, protest were the likes of the Kaduna State Governor, Malam Nasser El Rufai, President Muhammad Buhari, and several other people who run in government circles. And today, we're uh, you know, um, somewhat on the precipice. Oh, should we take out subsidy or not? Oh, let's bring it back. It seems to be a game of ping pong. Um, but what, what is best for Nigeria going forward for us to be able to regulate this sector properly? What is best for Nigeria is for those that are in power to be able to fix our refineries before they talk about subsidy removal. The refineries will need to be fixed. License for modular refineries will need to be issued. I am not really supporting oil extraction because the world is moving away from that. But for now, we need to be able to extract the oil, use it to solve the problem we have, and then be able to leave the soil in the soil. In the soil. So as much as we can for us to address this problem, those who are in power today are those who are thinking that fixing this problem will be easier for them. And they rode on that to power. So they should be able to address this issue. As we talk about subsidy removal, Nigerians should not be left in the hands of these exploiters that are importers that will be able to fix a thousand naira per liter of oil for Nigerians. Because you remember when we went on this, uh, you know, Occupy Nigeria protest years back, it was just a little increase below 100 naira. We went on the street, but today Nigerians are buying oil over 400 naira or a little less. And quietly people are, are going by that and not even finding it to buy. So if they leave us in the hands of these marketers, I believe that we are going to not be able to fix ourselves again or be able to do anything that we need petroleum product for because they are going to exploit Nigeria. So they should be able to fix the refineries. They should be able to give license for modular refinery. Vice President Yemi Osibanjo came in 2017 and talked about the modification of uh, artisanal refining by giving them a modular refinery license. We have formed cooperative societies for this year to receive those licenses. But to date, nothing has happened. So I think that they need to be able to address the issues that we have before they can open up the doors for us to have this subsidy removed. If subsidy is removed today, even in Aso Rock, it will be difficult for them to be able to operate. So okay. I think the only thing that Nigerians are benefiting from this process is this little token they pay on this subsidy. But if they have decided to remove it, they should make it in such a way that we'll be able to bear the consequences of that. Because right. there is nothing you do today that does not have to do with uh, powering your system for you to be able to do it. Well, I must say thank you. Fine Face uh, Dumnan Mene is the Executive Director, Youth and Environmental Advocacy Center. Uh, we want to say thank you to Comrade um, Celestine Akbobari, who is obviously of the Ogoni, um, for, uh, Ogoni Forum, and he's also the National Coordinator of Ogoni Solidarity Forum. We also want to say thank you to Lalekon Ige, who is a journalist who fell off uh, amid uh, the conversation. But I want to say thank you, gentlemen, for being part of the conversation, and I hope that it doesn't stop here. We'll continue uh, within our communities to spread the word. 
Thank you and happy new year to you and everyone that watch us this evening. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you for thank All you right. viewers. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, that's it on the show tonight. We will be back tomorrow talking for development. I'm Mariana Kumba. Don't forget, you need to go get your PBC. PBC collection ends on the 22nd of January. Find where you registered. Go pick your PBC because that's your passport to a new Nigeria. I'm Mariana Kumba. Have a good evening. Tonight, we take a look at the energy sector in Nigeria as the power grid has collapsed 98 times under the Buhari administration amid 1.52 trillion naira bailout and the fuel scarcity situation, even as New Bank threatens a nationwide strike. Again, the National Security Advisor Major General Baba Ghana Mungono forecast an estimated $23 billion loss this year if crude oil theft remains unchecked. This is Plus Politics. I am Mary Anako.